This morning we're going to continue on. I know it seems a bit strange. A week after Easter, everyone, it's... Uh, I saw a cute sign a, on a church billboard that said, Come join us this Easter. He's still alive. Um, it's funny to me how so many times we see the, cre- the, the Easter crowds and then as weeks go on, they start to dwindle off and dwindle off and dwindle off until such time as we go back to the original um, dedicated followers of Christ. And so I began to look in Scripture and try to understand, was this common? Was this something, you know, that we see, you know, what what does Scripture say about it? We like to ask that question. And it kind of drew me to the story of of one of the disciples um, who's earned a pretty rough nickname. Um, His name's Thomas. You know, when the disciples watched Christ die, they were off at a distance. We know Peter denied Christ. We know the other ones were kind of off in the distance watching the whole thing take place. They were in fear of uh, the repercussions of following Christ because now the, you know, his, the master, the Savior, is now dead. In their mind, he is, he's dead. So they're now infra- afraid of the situation. But then we know that he rose. And, of course, the excitement's out there. They're still, if you remember the scripture I shared, they ran up to the tomb. They looked in and saw, they saw the face cloth. We understood a little bit about that last week. But there was still a statement in there that said, they believed, but some doubted. There's a statement that kind of says that there's still an an uncertainty. They didn't understand. What did they see? You know, the Lord had not quite revealed to them, other than multiple times through Christ's life, He taught and He taught and He taught, saying, listen, on the third day I'll rise again. I go to prepare a place and my Father's going to send back. You know, they heard the story. And it kind of reminds me of the church today. We've heard the story a thousand times over. But then all of a sudden, Thomas... Christ had appeared to the disciples, but up to this point, Thomas had not been with them when Christ had appeared. So at this point, now they're running around and they're saying, man, Thomas, let me tell you, man, we saw Jesus. We saw Christ. He's risen. He's alive. We walked with him. We talked with him. Thomas is going, yeah, man, brother, I I hear you, but I don't know if I believe you. I I hear you. I understand you're excited. This energy you're getting from somewhere. But I, I, man, you know, matter of fact, uh, John 20, 24 through 28 is where the story is. It says, so the disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Now, this was a man who followed Christ. This is a man who walked with Christ. He was one who saw the miracles. He, a matter of fact, he's probably one, because we, we don't know exactly which ones did it, but he is probably one who did some of the miracles himself when the disciples went out and did things. He was one of those. But he struggled. He was faced with the situation now that unless I see, unless God proves himself to me, I won't believe. Now, it's easy to say, oh, well, man, he's sinning. He's thinking horrible. He's a bad person. How many of us, well, I haven't felt the Spirit move. I I haven't seen this happen, so it must not be true. Boy, it's getting quiet. I know I'm tired. I think, is anyone else tired? Okay, so we'll get through this. But Thomas, who walked with God, I kind of like to look at Thomas as one that, uh, of a dedicated church member. Matter of fact, I'm even going to step him up to be a board member of the church. He walked with Christ. But then when things happened, when problems arose, when issues came up, what happened? He took off. Like all the other disciples, he took off. And then the reports, the reports are coming back saying, we have seen him with our own eyes. Believe us, believe us. No, unless I see. Prove it to me. Now, some of you say, well, okay, well, he's a New Testament uh, disciple. He's confused. There's all new kind of concept here. You know, at this point, the Holy Spirit hadn't been down to earth yet. They're still learning about this whole thing. This is all brand new to them. But, you know, it's not an uncommon practice. 
You look at the, Israel, you know, the, the people of Israel. How many times that they did not hear from God. Many doubted. Habakkuk, all the different ones. Gideon was one who said, ah, you know, if you're God, why are we going through these things? If you're God, then what's... Uh, matter of fact, if you're God, you're going to wait here while I go prepare the offering. Man, that's pretty bold. Now, I'm also telling you, this is a man, the angel of the Lord, that we, know, that we believe to be Jesus at that scripture, was the Holy Spirit coming to him and saying, hey, warrior of God. This is a man declared to be a warrior of God. And, about, you know, Gideon goes, time out, man. I hear you. I hear you, but I don't know about this. Why is it that we've not heard from you lately? And then now you're talking to me. Why is it that if we are the chosen children of God, then why are we going through these things? Does that sound kind of familiar? Kind of like what the world's saying to us as Christians? If God is alive, then why do these things happen? If He's such a loving God, then why did this take place? It's called doubt. We have a bad tendency in the church, especially, to begin to doubt God when things don't go our way. Oh, well, this must not be of God. How do you know? Did he come down and say, this is not of me? <laughs> I'm just wondering. Doubt can create problems. There are times when we as Christians... When we're faced with an, you know, a sickness or something, we begin to doubt God's existence. We see the devastation all across the world. We see natural disasters that happen. And then the people, even in the church, begin to cry out, God, where were you? The world is easier. They're going to always cry out, God, where, if your God is there, then why? Is... Folks, let me explain something to you. Do you understand, I've shared this a couple weeks ago, the fact is when the curse came upon man back in the garden, there was another statement that was made and it said that the earth will create thistles and that it will create thorns and thistles. It will, the curse actually fell upon the earth also. The world became cursed with sin because of man's action. We can sit back and begin to blame God for everything, or we can just trust that He is still God. No matter what we're going through, whether it's a sickness or something of that nature, He is still God. We begin to doubt His existence through different situations. You know what? At times as Christians, when we mess up, we begin to doubt our salvation. We are real good in churches to bring judgment if you did this, then you are a sinner, lost without hope. Well, preacher, I just messed up. I'm making it right. We are quick to judge. And then we are quick to pay one sin. Now, have you ever noticed that this happens like in a generational basis? There becomes one sin that is just a, the unforgivable sin. Right? I'm not going to lay any titles out here right now. You know what I'm talking about. Every generation comes up with another one. The next generation is worse than this one, so it must be worse. Well, guess what, folks? They're all the same. Sin is sin. Don't let the mistake that. But the problem comes is when we begin to doubt our salvation. It's not healthy. You know, people get caught up in the 1 John 3, 9. It says, whoever is born of God does not commit sin. We like to throw that one out there. Let's take it in context. We have a tendency to throw Scripture at people and against situations. We create doubt within ourselves. But the other part is the doubt of God's goodness. Do you guys realize that God is good, Period. He is the author of all things good. Sin has entered the world. We understand that. Now, in the uh, 
I know in martial arts and other areas, there's a thing called yin yang. Have anyone ever heard that? You see the symbol, the white symbol and the black symbol. It shows equal opposing forces. And we have a tendency to think, for some reason, that the devil himself is the opposing force of God. Do we understand the devil has not the authority that God has? He is not equal to, he is not overpowering to, he is not even close to the power of God. But for some reason, we begin to doubt God and His ability. Whew, man. God is good. And all the time, <laughs> I love when I catch people doing that. But when we stop to think, we need to understand, now I'm, you guys know me, so far you know me, that I always say that God is a loving God, but He is also a just God. There's not just a point of salvation, there is also the growth that we must take. We cannot continue to walk in sin and call ourselves children of God and then demand that God allow us into His kingdom with the sin in our lives. Did you guys follow me there? We can't live that type of lifestyle. If you are born again, saved, then you will change. I'll tell you right now, the day I got saved, man, my whole world was flipped upside down in every direction. My world was different. Things changed. Now, there are a lot of different areas where doubt can come. We, we mentioned briefly about it sometimes in the church. We create doubt in ourselves. But we know the devil, he's good at creating doubt in us, man. He is real good. He's the one that's sitting back saying, you know what? If God really loved you, he wouldn't let you go through this. The thing is, is God's sitting back saying, man, if you go through this, you're going to be stronger on the other side. You don't have to go through this alone. I'm right here with you. I'll walk with you. I'll help you. I'll pick you up and carry you through this. If you're willing you know what? If you love me, you trust me. But the devil, man, he is cunning. He is so good at his job. I hate seeing and I hate him, giving him praise for that. But man, he is good at deceiving us. He's good at using what you think is right and turning it against you. So many times. So many times. The devil. You know, I, 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 over my years of ministry of what I've done, and most of you know my, church, my past, God, or God wants unity in the church. And unfortunately, there are so many times the devil used really good people to cause problems. Because they think that what they're doing is the will of God. But at times, the devil's good at kind of, hey, yeah, this is not right. Cause discourse. Cause problems. And I know I'm not going to get any amens on that one. But the other side of the thing, the world. The world creates doubt in us. It's a creative doubt. We look at the world outside and say, well, this, they're, you know, they're succeeding over here, so it must be right. You know, we look at mega churches. Now, I'm not going to beat up mega churches. I believe they have a place and a service. I believe they are reaching the loss for Christ, and who am I to judge any person who's reaching the loss of Christ? We might want to criticize them because they're bigger than us, because they're reaching more people than us, because they're more active than us. Wait a minute. <laughs> Those are all good things, right? But the reality is, is sometimes we get jealous. We look at something else. We look at something we want. We look at something we think we need. The world creates doubt in us. God, if you really love me, then how many of you ever prayed for something really nice? Lord, you know, I can use a car and I would really like this car over here. <laughs> and then you end up with something to just get you from point A to point B. It's okay. Because God knows our needs. We have a tendency sometimes in the world... Uh, you know, we, we speak wisdom in 1 Corinthians 2, 6. But we're not here about the things of this world. You know what? We're not even in battle against the things of this world. We're in battle against spiritual things. Spiritual warfare. And so all these things create this doubt in our lives. Well, I'm going to tell you one of the reasons. One of the number one reasons that we run into problems as Christians is called spiritual maturity or spiritual immaturity. We begin to run into doubt because of the fact that we've not ever really truly experienced God. 
I heard a, a funny little statement that said, churches are like pools. All the noise comes from the shallow end. Some of you got it. <laughs> so many times, our immaturity. You know, Thomas was doubting God because he'd not seen him himself. Because he's not actually witnessed. Now, if Christ, if, if Thomas had been there, well, man, that's a whole different sermon. If Thomas had been there with the disciples, he would have seen God earlier, right? And we wouldn't be calling him Doubting Thomas now, would we? Because he would have saw earlier and he would have believed earlier. It would have been no problem. But Thomas doubted God. So much to the point he said, I will not believe unless. He laid an ultimatum out before God. So many times we begin to doubt our walk with God. We begin to doubt the love of God. We begin to doubt the existence of God because we have not committed ourselves enough to God. We've not gotten to the Word of God to learn who God really is. We've not gone on our knees and cried out to Him to hear His voice speak to us. You out there? So many times we've not experienced. I, I love it when somebody says, well, hey, you know, okay, I'm going to lay this one out here. Well, I haven't seen God do miracles in a long time. Have you been to church lately? Look at the witnessing testimonies of those who said I had this problem, but God took it away from me. How many times have we prayed for someone and God healed them? Oh, but I haven't seen I haven't seen it unless I see it myself. Well, show up every once in a while. Side note. <laughs> but all this comes from an obedient relationship with God. An obedient relationship with God. We have to learn to talk to him. We got to learn to understand him. We have to learn to love him. We have to take time to listen to them. But the problem is we're so busy in our lives. We're so fast paced. Oh, we got to we got to do this. We got to go here. We got to go there. I can't be here because of this, that reason. That. Aren't you glad he took time to come down to earth and die for you? I, I'm, I mean, that's as simple as it can get. He took time to come here to die for you. And you can't find an hour, two hours, three hours, wait, we do three services, three hours a week, let alone your private time. Spiritual immaturity is the number one creator of doubt in God. Because if you've not experienced, you'll never truly believe. Doubting Thomas, he laid the ultimatum and said, unless, unless I put my finger, unless I put my hand. I will not believe. Emphatically. See, this is the beautiful part about God. He knew Thomas's heart. He knew Thomas was hurting. And so many times we get caught up in situations, we get caught up in events or activities, we get caught up in problems, we get caught up in things, and our heart really isn't leading towards these issues, but we get so caught up. God, unless you do this, unless you do that, unless you... God knows our heart. He knew Thomas's heart. What's funny is there's not any reference in here that says that the other disciples told Christ this issue or this problem. But then all of a sudden, Christ appeared to Thomas. He appeared and he said a week later, that with, a, week, a week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Side note. <laughs> Though the doors were locked, Jesus came in and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he immediately turned to Thomas and said, Thomas, put your fingers here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Then Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. It doesn't say Thomas put his finger in a wound. He doesn't say he put his hand in the side. But God loved Thomas so much 
that Thomas returned back with the group, became a part of the disciples again, began to be with them and pray. Now, in tonight's sermon, I'm going to talk a little bit about that locked door. But he was there with them. God moved again. God, Christ came to him. Thomas witnessed the miracle that Christ had been risen. And God loved him so much, said, here, Thomas, if this is what it takes, if this is what is required for you to believe, here it is. Thomas didn't reach out to him and touch. Thomas realized what he had done wrong. And he declared, my God, my Lord. We have to learn to confess our doubt to God. I even want to kind of throw the idea out. Sometimes doubt becomes a sin in our lives. We need to confess our doubt to God. Ask Him to forgive us of our doubt. We need to study the Word of God. Learn who God really is. Then when He moves or doesn't move, you'll understand. Habakkuk argued all throughout his story, telling people, Lord, where were you? Where were you, God? We're in trouble again. Where are you? The silence sometimes, God's silence has a tendency to do one of two things. Either it makes us pray harder or doubt more. If you're a pray harder one and you trust that God is still God, He's still in control. He still has full authority and he has not left you. You trust in his word. You would, I'd probably say, is probably more towards the spiritual mature. But if you're one that his silence creates doubt and separation and anger and bitterness, then I'm going to kind of lean you toward the immaturity. The choice is going to be yours to talk to God and tell him, Lord, I'm sorry. Sorry I doubted you. Now, church, I'm going to throw this out there to you. Sometimes churches doubt God more than anything. Well, we can't do this because we can't afford it. Man, is God not able to provide? So many times, well, well we're not reaching the loss. Well, I, I, I'm, maybe we're doubting God's ability. We talk about prayer. We talk about praying. Well, God's not hearing me. Are you speaking more? Are you taking time to love God more? Even in the church, we don't do things in fear. What do we have to fear if God is with us? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Oh, but preacher, we need to make sure. I am going to get on my knees and I'm going to make sure. But I'm also going to, you know, I, <laughs> you guys ever heard the story about the man stuck on the roof in a flood? And then he dies and goes to heaven. He said, I sent you a helicopter, I sent you a boat, I sent you a raft that you didn't get on. Oh, God will take care of us. Sometimes we have to take steps of faith. Sometimes we got to stop doubting God. Next Sunday, Brother Gallimore is going to be here. We are entering into Revival. I'm not really, and I, I do this because I don't believe that a man can come and say, okay, well, here, we're starting a revival now. It starts with you. It starts with you praying. It starts with the church not doubting. It starts with leadership saying that I believe God is able to do all things. And stepping out in faith and assurance to know that God is in control. Revival starts with us crying out to God. For revival. Are you willing? Because I'm going to tell you, revival will change your life forever. Right? Are you ready? I'm going to try something next week. I'm probably going to get in trouble by just throwing this out there. But next Saturday night, 7 o'clock, I want to ask the church to come pray. We're starting revival, right? We're starting revival. So let's start praying revival into our church. Yeah. Next Saturday, 7 o'clock. I, I remember hearing stories even around here. As a matter of fact, this front section up here, you guys would call this the, the, prayer, the prayer warrior people up there, the shouters. I, 
Someone said that to me not too long ago, this front section up here. What, what's scary is this front section is empty today. Or somewhat empty, sorry guys. <laughs> sorry. If we're going to be a church that understands and knows who God is, we need to stop doubting and start crying out again to him. I would rest assured to say, I mean, I'm going to step out on a lot of faith here. If you come and begin to pray for revival, I believe that God is faithful to hear our prayers and create revival in this church. Just a crazy preacher's idea, I know. But next Saturday, 7 o'clock, even if I'm the only one here, I'm going to pray for revival in this church. Do you trust God? Are you on the shallow end of the pool or are you on the deep end? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you came. He died. We thank you that you rose again. And Father, I pray this morning that we would begin to understand the idea of true faith and true obedience, Lord. That we'd begin to stop doubting, Lord, and trust that you are God and you are still in control. We have the story in Scripture. We hear it preached time and time again. But so many times we still start to doubt. We understand and we submit ourselves as obedient children that, Lord, Your will will be done. We need to stop excusing ourselves with that statement, if it's God's will. Lord, it's Your will that every man, woman, and child will come to know Your truth. So why do we not take it anymore? Why do we not take the Word out? Lord, forgive us. Forgive us of our doubt. Lord, we love you. Lord, I pray as next week. Lord, I pray even this week that the people who are called by your name would humble themselves and pray. Lord, that scripture is so powerful because we are your children who are called by your name. I pray, Lord, that you, in this week you would begin, and then, Lord, that we would allow you to humble us. And we begin to cry out. Begin to pray. And Lord, as we close this time together, I ask that you'd give us an opportunity this week to share the good news with somebody to invite somebody to our revival services. Pray for our lost loved ones. Lord, I pray that we find confidence in you. That we not live in doubt. But we'd stand firm on the promises you've given us. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen.